How are you today? Good. Did you have a good week? Yeah. Are you disappointed that it's me? <laughs> Be very, very careful. I have a lot of authority around here. Not, huh? Yeah, Kathy's not here today. She's away, and so I'm taking her place. I'm not quite as pretty as her, am I? But anyway, I'm going to do the best that I can. And I wish Joyce was here, because I want to say, Joyce, I did not babble once this week. Not once. <laughs> anyway, it's good. Are you all ready for VBS? All ready for VBS. Are you excited about it? Yeah, good. Well, can I tell you about a little vacation I had a couple of weeks ago with my brother David and one of our cousins? We flew to Prince Edward Island. You know what that is? That's one of our provinces way over on the East Coast for a few days to take care of some family business. And um, so while that's PEI is where my dad grew up as a little boy and a teenager, and so we were visiting some of the places where he grew up. And while we were there, we did some visiting. In fact, I'm going to show you some pictures. You want to look right up here? So we saw the house where my, my dad lived 90 years ago as a boy and a teenager. See, there's, it's still living. That's the house where my dad was born and raised 90 years ago. How many of you here 90 years ago? Were you here? Huh? <laughs> that house is now blue and red. It was purple when I was there a few years ago, but now it's kind of blue. And then here's a picture, the next picture. There's a picture of some farmland where one of my grand, great-grandfather's farms were. And there's a bunch of rubble there. You can't see it in this picture, but back in behind those trees, there's a bunch of rubble where a house once stood. And you know what that is? That's a spindle from the staircase of my great-grandmother and grandfather, Robert Ellis, and um, Charity was her name, Charity Young, I think, and they, anyway, that was um, their house. Then the next picture, a really pretty picture, that's a little fishing village called French River where some of my relatives worked years and years and years ago fishing on the French River, which kind of goes into the, um, isn't the ocean. Isn't that, isn't that pretty? And then we walked down some roads where my dad used to drive a team of horses, you know, taking milk to, to, uh, to Charlottetown. And then, I don't have a picture of it, but there was a little schoolhouse where my dad went to school. And again, I didn't get to see the schoolhouse, but there was right in a grove of trees, there was a pile of bricks. And that's a brick from the schoolhouse where my dad went to grade one and grade two and grade three and grade four. And I think in grade eight, he went working on the farm. But anyway, that's a brick from um, the schoolhouse. And then here's kind of the last picture. There it is. That is um, a, the gravestone. And you know who Elsie is? She's my grandmother. And that's my great-grandparents, Robert and Charity Young. And we were there to bury some um, ashes. Um, and that's, that's my grandmother. Now, while we were there, we met some third cousins once removed. You know what third cousins once removed are? Huh? That's my dad's third cousins, but because it's me, they're third removed. But we, we, just, had a, we just had a lot of fun. Um, but so much fun tracing my family roots. But maybe you're saying, you know, Reverend Bob, who cares? You know? <laughs> really. I mean, who cares? I mean, old houses and, you know, old fields and, like, gravestones. I mean, why is that important? But you know why it's important? It reminds me of who I am. Huh? And where I came from and who I belong to. I'm a quick, Right? I'm a son and a grandson, I'm a part of this wonderful family called the Quicks, and includes Youngs and Ellises and Courts and Bells. I'm not just little old Bob in this world. I'm part of this wonderful family, and it reminds me of who my roots are. Do you know what it got me thinking? It got me thinking that one of the reasons I like to come to church, when I come to church and when I sing the songs we sing, when I hear verses from the Bible read, when I hear songs sung, and when I hear prayers and messages and when I hang out with church people, you know what it reminds me of? Just like this brick and this spindle, it reminds me of who I am. Church reminds me of who I am and who I belong to. You know, God reminds me at church that I'm a somebody, that I belong to somebody, and I'm here on earth for a purpose. You see, I'm a child of God, and I'm a part of this wonderful family, just like you are, called the family of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm loved for, I'm loved and I'm cared for, and I'm special, and I'm valuable. In fact, I'm so valuable, just like you, that Jesus came to earth just for me to die for my sins so I can spend forever and ever and ever as part of God's family. So, just like the spindle and the brick, remind me of who I am. I'm a quick, and I belong to this wonderful family. When I come to church, when I hear the stories, and when you go down to Sunday school and hear the stories, you're reminded that you are part of this wonderful family called the family of God. And that you are very special. God knows your name. You're special. You're cared for. 
and Jesus died for me. So you know what? Thanks for coming to church and being a part of this wonderful family. You are very special parts of my church family. Okay? Let's pray before you go downstairs for Sunday school. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you put us in wonderful earthly families with parents and grandparents and other extended family that love and care for us and make us feel special. We also thank you for this wonderful church family called St. Andrews, where groups of people who support one another and love one another and remind us that we're part of God's family and that we're his very special children and valuable to him. May each of these boys and girls recognize how special and valuable and important they are to their Heavenly Father. Bless them now. I praise they go downstairs for their Sunday school time and bless those who go um, to teach them and to work with them. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We are continuing our series, uh, which we started actually back in January, going through the book of Genesis. We've heard some really good feedback, so I'm glad to hear that many of you are being blessed by the sermons. Today we come to Genesis chapter 2, and a very famous story, which was very well known. I'm not going to do justice to it, because basically we can spend, you know, a series on just this chapter but I hope that God would bless you with these words. May uh, let us hear God's word. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 22, and then I'm going to read just a couple of uh, verses from Hebrews 11, which is basically a commentary about Genesis chapter 2. So let's hear God's word, Genesis chapter 2. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place which God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, 
And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Testing. Everyone is tested. Anybody has, who has grown in their faith is because they've been tested. In the test of faith, you're told to trust God because he will bless you. He will heal you. He will bring you happiness. But during times of testing, everything about your life could be further from the blessing, can be further from health, can be further from happiness. Friends, wherever you may be, either going through a time of testing right now, or you have gone through a time of testing, I want us to see through Abraham's incredible story how the testing of God will lead you to a life of power and strength, a life of peace and equilibrium, a life of fullness and freedom, a great life, a life of spiritual joy and spiritual growth, so that you can face anything. Whatever life throws at you, you'll be able to face anything with such poise and rest that other people around you will look at you and say, you're different. What's different about you? So first we must come to terms that God tests. Genesis 22 clearly begins, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And in the brief account in Hebrews, it says God tested Abraham. This is the first thing we learn about growing in faith. There will be, or has been, times of testing. Remember when you were in school, it didn't matter what subject you were learning, there was always a test. At least when I was going to school, I don't know if they did away with testing, but... And a test was, to, was a way to show you how much you knew or how much you didn't know. And it was also a way to make you learn more. In other words, in life, a test shows you up and it can grow you up. Life's test tells you where you're at and then you can either choose to grow by it or not. I remember in university there were a few times when the profs would give a test and the only reason for the test was really to pare down the class. I remember an economics class I took of 300 students. After the first test, which was 25% of your final grade, the class was a lot smaller. That prof used the test to get people to drop his class. And it worked. Because if you fail that first test, it's 25% of your total mark, which means you're not going to get anything higher than a B to begin with, right? So a lot of people dropped the test, uh, the class. That is not the way God tests. But the majority of the reasons why God, when you're tested, is to learn stuff. The reason why teachers administer tests is so that their students can learn. So they prepare you, they tell you what's going to be on the test, and they train you for the test so that you can grow in knowledge, grow in understanding. It doesn't just show you up, but it makes you grow. Regardless of how tests are administered, tests are not fun. They are horrible things. Tests make you nervous. You can't think of anything else but that upcoming test. It just kind of hangs over your head until it's done. But because they're so unpleasant, they are effective. In life, tests make you look at yourself in ways you wouldn't otherwise. It makes you grow in ways you wouldn't otherwise. And that's the reason why a little later on in Hebrews chapter 12, 11 says, God's testing is not pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the first thing we see that is God tests. Secondly, let's see how tests work. Hebrew verse 18 says this, even though God had said. And this is important to see how God's testing works. 
oftentimes the test seems to contradict God's promise. What was God's promise to Abraham? That he was going to bless him with many descendants through Isaac. Through Isaac, God was going to bring about a great nation that was going to bless the whole world. All that was promised to him. But now, what was God asking him to do? He had to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice. When to trust God or to obey him seems to contradict his promise, you know you are being tested. And a test to obey God will appear to be foolish or even feel very, very wrong. You know, God's promises are tremendous. Here are a few which I have highlighted in my Bible. Luke 21, 18. Not a hair on your head will be harmed. Ephesians 3, 20. I will give you immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine. Philippians 4.19, I will meet all your needs according to my riches in glory. God's promises, I will bless you. I love you. I want to shower blessings on you. And yet, to obey him, to trust him, at times of testing, is going to feel like he's leading you to disaster, to incredible sacrifice. And sometimes, you might even feel like he's leading you to death. Let me give you some examples. What if you had a teenage son who was dying of cancer? You're not really different from Abraham. According to the word of God, you're to continue to serve and obey God as the powerful and wise, loving and merciful God, in spite of the fact that your child is dying. It's a test. Or what if speaking the truth at work was going to lead to a loss of a lot of money? God's command is to speak truth, but you know if you obey, not only will you not get a lot of money blessing, you might not even have a job. You know you're being tested when your feelings are strong against a command and your wisdom looks a lot better than God's wisdom. You know... Proverbs 3, this, this, uh, this wonderful promise, trust in the Lord and what? Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. You know, when life is going well, it's going the way you think it should, that verse is beautiful and makes so much sense, right? It's filled with promises and joy and promises of more joy. And you feel like you're just kind of skipping along this narrow path. But when you're at a point where there seems to be contradiction in God's word about promise and obedience, like when you believe God always heals, and yet you have to watch helplessly as your kid dies, or when you're told God has a wonderful plan for your life, and yet you can't figure out how this wonderful plan fits with all the failures in your life. This is God's testing. This is when trust in the Lord and lean not on your understanding is going to take a whole new level. I'm sure Abraham felt like he was going to die as he traveled for three days to the place where God told him to go. And yet, he believed. He believed that God could bring about a resurrection from his death. He didn't know how, he didn't know when, but he trusted God to do the impossible. He could bring life out of death. Friends, it's not easy to obey. It's not, it's easy to choose not to listen, not to tell the truth at work because no one else is going to expect you to. It's easy to choose to give up on God because you feel like he took your child away. It's easy to choose that. It's But if you choose not to move forward in obedience, you're refusing to trust God. And you know, Job, Job in the book, the Bible, this was Job's test as well. Satan said the only reason, Satan said to God, the only reason Job is obeying you, serving you, believing in you, worshiping you is because things are going well for him and he is blessed. But 
Job continued to obey God, continued to worship God, even after all was taken from him. So the first thing we learn is that God gives us tests. Secondly, the nature of the test is that often what we need to do when we need to trust God to listen to his command will feel like it's a contradiction to his promises, to his blessings. Thirdly, why does God test us? Let's see why he tests us. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, God says to Abraham this. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Why did God say your son, your only son? The fact of the matter is that Isaac wasn't Abraham's only son. We know this. Who was Abraham's other son? Ishmael. But the point of the matter is this. As far as Abraham is concerned, Isaac was his only. Isaac was the only of his life. A commentator, uh, commentary by A.W. Tozer said, Abraham had become the love slave of his son. Isaac was at the center of Abraham's life. Remember earlier I say that God's testing shows you up? God's testing shows us what our onlys are. It shows me what really is at the center of my life. If only I was married, everything would be great. I know that's not right now. <laughs> Sorry, honey, I know. Um, but what is your only? If only I could achieve a certain status in my career. If only I had so much money. If only I had a certain kind of beauty. If only, if only, then my life would be fine. Sometimes, in our effort to grow in our faith, of walk, uh, uh, in our faith walk, we try very hard to live a good life and to do Christian work and to serve and to grow. But if that, even that, becomes your only, there's an incredible danger. If all the other things go out the door in the name of doing your Christian duty, it's going to stop you of your energy and of life. When your Christian service becomes your only rather than trusting in the grace of God, then you're in danger of becoming like the Pharisees whom Jesus rebuked over and over again. So there's nothing wrong with these, these onlys in general. But when they become your onlys, it is no longer a good thing. When those things become your only, they're going to drive you to achieve it. And if you don't get it, you're going to be in despair, you're going to be angry, you're going to be bitter. Or if that only is threatened, you're going to be incredibly filled with anxiety. In Jeremiah chapter 17, he says this. He said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They are like a tree planted by water. They do not fear when he comes. Their leaves remain green and is not anxious about a year of drought. Friends, the question is, where is your trust? Is it in you? Is it in the blessings? Or is it in the blesser? So then finally, how do we pass this test? How can we obey even if it looks like death awaits us if we obey. When choosing God doesn't look like it's going to lead to blessings, but to death, how do we pass this test? Abraham passed this test two ways. One is that he reasoned. Hebrews 11:19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Friends, Christian obedience is never blind obedience. It's never thoughtless. It's always filled with thinking. It's not a leap into the dark. Some might think that Abraham knew that God would raise Isaac from the dead, and, 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 but that's not what it says. Abraham did not whistle up that mountain with Isaac. Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead, not that he would. Abraham looked at who God is. He looked at who God is and the capabilities of, of God. Friends, when you're at a time of testing, when you, ask, you need to ask yourself, who is God and who am I? And what has he done in the past for me? And when you do that, 
you'll see that it's completely reasonable to obey God, even in death. Second thing Abraham did was to look to the lamb. When they got to the foot of the mountain, Abraham told his servant to stay behind, and he took the wood and placed it on Isaac's back. He took the fire and he took the knife, and they walked up the mountain. And then suddenly Isaac cried out, Wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Here's the wood, here's the fire, here's the knife, where is the lamb? And what did Abraham say? God himself will provide the lamb. Abraham believed. He believed that God would provide. So then how do we pass the test? First, we must reason. We must reason that it's foolish not to obey God, not to trust God, the God of the universe, the one who knows everything, the one who sees everything. It's unreasonable not to obey him. And secondly, we must look to the Lamb. Abraham believed God could provide a Lamb. We, on the other hand, are at a far more advantageous position than Abraham was because God has already shown us the Lamb. Abraham and Isaac climbed Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was where the temple was built, which means it was right next to Calvary. Centuries later, God walked up his son to the mountain. Like Abraham, God put the wood for the sacrifice on the back of his son. Like Isaac, Jesus cried out to his father. But unlike Abraham, God gave up his firstborn his only son, as a sacrifice for sin. Remember when God said, when Abraham was about to bring down the knife, God said, stop. In Genesis 22, he said, Abraham, now I know. Well, we too can say that to God. God, now I know. Now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love. Friends, what are you facing? What do you stand to lose if you choose to trust God rather than your feelings? Will you surrender to the one who surrendered everything for us? If you're struggling, if you're angry, if you're bitter or anxious, it's because something needs to be decentralized, decentered. Obey God, trust God, surrender to Him as you look to the Lamb of God and say to Him, Now, Lord, now I know that you love me. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, that you love us so much that you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love from us. We pray that we would see all of our tests in the light of that great test you had to endure. We pray that we would be overwhelmed by your love. Then we will be able to continually obey you in the tests of our life and find ourselves growing more and more in assurance and power, humility and love and freedom. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen. May that be our prayer. I surrender all to you, Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and guidance of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.